It is hard for me to believe that tonight is the last night of our gospel meeting. I appreciate so much the kindness that you have shown to me and all of the good things that you've said. I appreciate that. You've been great encouragers this week. And I hope that I've been an encouragement to you. And we pray that we'll continue to encourage one another. Maybe we'll be able to see one another, you know, again, anytime you get down to the Jasper area on Sunday or Wednesday, we'd love to have you at Midway and love to see you there and worship with us at those uh, uh, times. But uh, if we don't, then maybe one of these days we'll all be able to spend eternity together and enjoy one another's company without ever having to depart. I want to say thank you again to our song leader tonight, Brother Elijah, great song leader. Appreciate him, all of those who have led this week. We're so thankful for you using your talent in order to help praise and glorify God. And again, for the food that we had tonight. It's hard to beat barbecue and baked potatoes. You just have a hard time doing that. Now, I have eaten a lot of bites this week. You know, ever since Sunday at lunch and then Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, I've had a lot of bites. You want to know one thing that they've all had in common? They've all been good. I haven't had one single bad bite. And I appreciate you so much, the ladies and men who've helped in preparing that. You are appreciated. As we begin tonight, thinking about what's uh, our, the topic of our lesson tonight, I, I want you to know that about two years ago, Marlene and I decided that we were going to go down to the coast. Now, we hadn't been there in years and years and years. A lot of people like to go down either to uh, uh, Gulf Shores or they go to Orange Beach or somewhere like that. And so we decided to go down there and spend some time down there. Well, you know, I got to thinking about that. We happened to stop on this uh, particular trip and stopped in at Priester's Pecans. If you know where that is, it's in uh, Fort Deposit, Alabama, just off of the interstate. There are no telling how many times we have passed by that business establishment because we used to live in South Alabama. My last year at Faulkner, I preached down in a little place called Appleton, just north of Bruton. And so traveling back and forth from school, I don't know how many times I passed by, but we had never stopped. But I tell you that to tell you this. According to Google Maps, the halfway point, or about the halfway point, is somewhere near Fort Deposit, Alabama. Can you imagine if we had gone down to, Fort, uh, uh, gone down to Gulf Shores and gotten to Fort Deposit and just stopped? We got there to Priester's Pecans, and we said, okay, that's as far as we're going to go. We're not going to go any farther. We, we've, we've gotten here, and we're not going to go on down. Well, I'm pretty sure we could have had some pretty good treats, you know, from Priester's Pecans. But there's one thing we couldn't have, and that is that seafood that you have. And another thing you couldn't do is sit on the porch there at Priester's Pecans and look out and see the sand in the gulf. You just simply can't do it. There are some things that you have to go more than halfway. You have to go all the way in order to enjoy the benefits of them. There's a man that I read about in the Bible who went approximately halfway to where he was going. If you have your Bible with you tonight, turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter 11. And let's simply read verses 31 and 32. There the Bible says, And Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and they went out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. So the days of Terah were 205 years. Now watch the last part. And Terah died in Haran. He got about halfway, approximately halfway from where he had started to where he was going. Now some may be asking, well, why did he decide to go from Ur of the Chaldees over to Canaan? And the only answer that I know is found in the New Testament in the book of Acts chapter number 7. In Acts chapter 7 verses 2 and 3, what we find is that God had appeared to Abram, Abraham, prior to the time that they left the homeland where they had been living and told him to go to a place that he would show him. Now, all of us remember that. 
And so it may well have been that uh, God had spoken to Abraham and Abraham had convinced his family. We know according to the book of Joshua chapter number 24 that at, at least one point in his life, Tira was a worshiper of idols. And so at this point, we don't know if he himself had become a worshiper of God or if it was just the fact that Abraham had convinced him to go. But at any rate, what we know is that he had gone and he got somewhere around halfway to where he was going. Many of you may remember the 2015 Alabama Crimson Tide National Championship year. There was a man, on the player on the field, by the name of uh, Jaron Reed. He was a defensive uh, lineman on that team. And uh, he made this statement, and I think it's pretty good. He said, finish, which was their motto, he said, finish is more than a motto, it's a mindset. It means finish whatever we're doing. We need to finish. We're finishing at practice, finishing at workout, finishing the play, finishing the reps, finishing off tackles, and then finish the game. You know, if you're not doing those types of things, it's going to be hard to win or be successful. And I would have to say tonight that I'm convinced that Reed is right. We must finish. We must be finishers if we want to be successful in Christian living as well. And so tonight, if if you were to die tonight, I want you to listen closely to what I ask. If you were to die tonight, where would you want to spend eternity? Now, I didn't ask you if you died tonight, where would you spend eternity? I simply ask you tonight, where would you want to spend eternity? I I'm going to venture to say that most of us in this good audience tonight would say that I want to spend my eternity in heaven. I want to be there in heaven. That's where I want to spend my eternity. Now, the folks from Midway know that I'm not usually consent, uh, content to ask one question. I always have to follow up with something, you know, because I want to dig just a little bit deeper. And so here's my follow-up question. My question is this, why... Would you want to spend eternity in heaven? If you want to spend eternity in heaven, why would you want to spend eternity in that place? H have you ever considered just how important it is to know why you want to go to heaven? Many people say, I want to go, but many people don't really stop and consider why they want to go to heaven. And a lot of people, maybe even the majority of the people in our world, and perhaps even in the church, would answer that question something like this, because I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven because I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to spend my eternity in a place of punishment. Now don't raise your hand tonight, but if you were thinking something like that, if that was something that popped into your mind, you can just give me one of those little winks or one of those nods, you know. Maybe, maybe that was one of the things that came into your mind. But please don't think I'm trying to insult you if that's the case with you. Don't think that's what I'm trying to do at all when I say you poor, pathetic soul. What? You call me a poor, pathetic soul because... I want to go, uh, I, I, I don't want to spend eternity in hell. I, I would rather spend it in heaven. Uh, yeah, in a sense, that's what I'm saying to you. And the reason for that is this. There are some, what I believe to be better reasons to want to go to heaven than simply saying, because I don't like the alternative, that I don't want to go to hell. That's what we want to talk about tonight in the time that we have allotted in this last lesson of our gospel meeting. Let's first, as we think about it, let's think about heaven and then think about heaven in a summary form. The summary of heaven. Now, if I were to give you a piece of paper tonight, maybe you've got your own pen or I'd need to provide one, but if I were to give you a piece of paper tonight and I were to ask you to write out your 
description of heaven, what would you write? Now, now again, I, you, you think about the Bible, but I want you, in your mind's eye, the picture that you paint in your mind of heaven, what would you write down in order to describe this heaven that we're talking about tonight? Well, somebody might describe it as a place where uh, there's no pollution. And, and maybe they live in a big city or something like that. There's no pollution and the skies would be always crystal clear. There's nothing to block our view. Well, that would be beautiful, would it not? Somebody might say, well, you know, there's no crime and no violence since there will be no criminals that will be there. That would be a blessing especially to some of the folks who live in bigger cities right now. And the crime wave that's going on in our, our big cities and how some are getting off without any punishment whatsoever and being released back on the street after they've committed a, a major crime only to commit the same thing over and over again. It would be a blessing to live in a place where there was no criminals that we would have to worry about, would it not? That would be something that would be great. Somebody else might say, well, there are no greedy pro uh, po politicians and no drug dealers and, and no child molesters. Well, that would be good too. And I hope all of those that we just mentioned would come to a realization that there is a God in heaven that they will have to answer to him and become obedient to, them, to him. But those who remain unrepentant in those roles, they won't be there. And so again, it would be a blessing for us to live in that way. Somebody else just says, well, there are no potholes. It's a beautiful place, the street of gold. No potholes in the street of gold. Now, I've told the folks at Midway this, and I've told it in gospel meetings before. But I said, if I ever go missing, I want y'all to come down my road, my street that I live on, and I want you to search all the potholes because there are some that are so big I may have fallen off in one and couldn't get out. So y'all come looking for me there. It's not a, not a pleasant thing to go bouncing and almost shake your car completely apart. But then another one might say, well, you know, there's abundant parks. There are flowers that line the street. There are these beautiful trees that you just can't imagine how pretty they are, how beautiful they are. And they're always in bloom, constant bloom. And it's always so beautiful with rolling meadows and things of that nature. Maybe that is the way that you picture heaven. Now, if that's what heaven was like, it would be wonderful, wouldn't it? It would be to have all of those things. But how does the Bible describe heaven? What does the Bible have to say about it? I know there's some things said in the book of Revelation in regard to, to, to the gates of the city and things of that nature, but there are three things in particular that I want to look at tonight. Number one, if you turn in your Bible to the book of Hebrews chapter 11, begin reading with me at verse 14. Hebrews chapter 11 at verse 14. We'll read down through about verse number 16. The Bible says, for those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a, listen to this word, a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country, now the word country, if you're looking at maybe the King James or the New King James, you're going to see that word country is in italics, which means that it has been supplied for us. But as we look at it and continue reading, we're going to use that word they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better. That is a heavenly, again the word country is in italics, a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. The word country, translated back in the very first part of this passage, Homeland is what we want to think about for just a moment. A homeland. Now the word homeland, translated homeland here, refers to a population center from which a person comes. 
It's, uh, again, according to the lexicons with the original language, the definition of the original words, uh, they say that is to say a place of one's birth or childhood or the place from which one's family has come. Another said the place from which a person originates. And so we sort of understand that. But the word itself is a word from which they would take their word father. Father. It's related, if you ever hear someone talking about their granddad on their daddy's side, my paternal grandfather, or you hear of a paternity test, it's from that word that we get this word that's here. A homeland or a, literally, fatherland. For a father, They're looking for a fatherland. But it's not just any fatherland. We might say that we were born in the United States of America and that is our fatherland here. Somebody else may have been born in some foreign country other than the United States of America and that would be their fatherland. I've known people who have gone back to visit their quote-unquote fatherland through the years because they still had relatives maybe in England or Scotland or in some other place like that. They've gone back and they visited those but a fatherland. But what's even more interesting about what is said here in this passage is that it is a fatherland, and down at the end of the passage, we understand that that the Bible talks about it being a, a better land, and then it describes it as being a heavenly country. The word that's used in that passage, that word, it is a word which literally means, comes from a word which means sky. And the word itself has to do with simply being above the sky. They were looking for a place not to go back to, coming out of Ur of the Chaldees or Haran or wherever it may have been. They were looking for a fatherland that is beyond the sky, above the sky. Wow, that's heaven. Now why would you be able to describe heaven as a fatherland? Well, I can think of one good reason. Brother Vance, my father is there. My father, my heavenly father is in that heavenly country. Now, we're going to come back to that in just a few minutes. But heaven is described here as a celestial fatherland. What a beautiful description. Not only is heaven described as a country, it's also described as a city. As a city. Again, in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 11, if you back up just a few verses to number 9, verse number 9, there the Bible says, By faith he dwelled in the land of promise in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob. You understand he's talking about Abraham. The heirs with him of the same promise. For he had waited for the city, which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now as you begin to think about this passage, I want you to know how Abraham is described. Notice there back in verse number 9 that, that this uh, patriarch, this man that we call the father of the faithful, we're told specifically in this passage in what he lived. He lived in tents along with Isaac and Jacob. The passage says in verse number 9, he lived in a tent. But Abraham wanted a more permanent place. Abraham wanted something that had some foundations to it rather than just his tent that he used to travel and move from place to place. He said he wanted a city which has foundations. A city which has foundations. But not just any city. He wasn't looking to find one here on this earth that had a nice wall around it where he'd be protected. He wasn't looking for a place that he could build a house, if you will, on this earth. He wanted a place that had foundation and 
this abiding place, the one that had the foundations. Again, it wasn't just anyone, but it was one of which God was both the builder and the maker. If you do a little research on those two words, the word translated builder would roughly translate into to meaning the craftsman. The craftsman is God. And not only is the craftsman God, but the word translated maker, it, it, we could roughly translate that as the architect. The one who designed it and the one who made it with his hands is God. That's the kind of city that has foundations that Abraham was looking for. And that's the way we're told about heaven in the scriptures. Heaven is a place that comes from the very mind of God. The architect. And heaven is a place, as it were, for our understanding, that was built by the skillful hands of God the craftsman. If God could speak everything that we know into existence... The beautiful sky, the stars, the sun, the moon, the trees, all of the things that we see. If God could speak that into existence, what must he have been able to do in his mind and with his hands, as it were, in building this city? I'm left in awe. I can't even begin to imagine the beauty and wonder of heaven. But then number three, not only do we read about heaven being described as a country and a city, it's also described simply as a home. If you go back into the Old Testament, back into the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, at verse number 5, you may remember that the wise man writes these words. He says, also they are afraid of height and the terrors in the way. When, when the almond tree blossom, who are you talking about, Solomon? I'm talking about those folks who are getting older. I, I'm getting some of that almond up here on the top. You know, my hair has been turning gray and white ever since I was in my 30s. He's talking about them. You know, we have a hard time with a lot of things as we get up. He goes on in this passage. And, and notice what he, how he continues on. He said, uh, the grasshopper is a burden. And desire fails. Get off my lawn. And desire fails. For man goes to his eternal home. And the mourners go about the streets. Eternal home. It's interesting to me that the word used, the Hebrew word used here, is translated and means generally a house. If you search the word and you find all of the instances, which there are many, I didn't copy down how many there were, but there were numerous uses of this one word, most of which are translated house. He goes to his eternal house. Is that reminiscent of what we read in John chapter 14 at verse number 2? Jesus, on the night before his crucifixion, said, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? God has, at least for the understanding that we as human beings have, God has a house. Refers, the word used here refers to a building in which one dwells. That's what the house is describing here the word that's used here. And in that house, we have what's referred to in the King James and the New King James as a mansion. But probably more accurate, it would be simply a room. It refers to a place where one may remain or dwell. A place where you can go to stay for a while. 
I want you to think about it in these terms. In God's house, his children will forever have a place to stay. Wow. That's one of the descriptions of heaven for me. When we're at home, when we're in our own house, there's some things that we expect. We expect that we can have some rest when we go home, don't we? I enjoy being with people. I love being with people. I love talking to people, being around them, hearing what they have to say, hearing their stories and all of those things. But there are just some days I get tired. And I really, you know, would rather just go home and rest for a little while. Y'all ever been like that? No matter how much you enjoy something, even if it's um, a sport or some activity, maybe hunting or something like that, sometimes you just get tired and you want to go home. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verse 13, we hear it a lot at the funeral of a Christian. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, Come. Or, uh, or right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Do we get tired of life sometimes with all of the struggles that we're sometimes faced with, with all of the sadness and heartaches and all of those things? Don't we just get tired? Wouldn't you want a place? To rest. We expect to have security in our homes. In, in this life, we seek security through bank accounts and retirement accounts and insurance accounts and any other kind of account that you can probably think about. But we know that there's security in heaven. In the book of Matthew, chapter nine, uh, 6, verses 19 through 21, Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt where thieves break in and steal but do what with it lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven why let me put it in country boys terms ain't no robbers up there ain't no thieves ain't no moth that's going to destroy it what's the what is the point a place of security it's in the house of god And so as we think about heaven, we may have a picture in our mind of what it's like. And we can think about heaven, you know, from from the standpoint tonight of a summary. But let's also think about it from the standpoint of a superlative. What's a superlative? Something that deals with it from the idea of being something better. I want to ask you another question. And again, if I were to give you a sheet of paper, and you were to write it down, what would you write? What do you think will be the best part of heaven? What would be the best part of heaven for you? I know some of the answers that people sometimes give. Oh, preacher, there won't be any sickness, and there won't be any pain, and there won't be any sadness up there. I can't wait. Preacher, don't you know that there won't be any death so we'll never have to say goodbye? I even used that a little earlier tonight as we were introducing this lesson or getting started into it. Maybe we can all be together for eternity there. But I want you to know something tonight. Those are both fantastic. They're great. They're tremendous. All those superlative terms that you can use they're all just wonderful but I am not convinced that those kinds of things are the best part of heaven not the best part do we realize that God has always wanted fellowship wanted a relationship with his creation. Back in Genesis chapter 3 at verse number 8, the Bible says, they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. 
The Bible never says that Adam and Eve literally took strolls with God in the garden. Sometimes we misconstrue that. The Bible never says that they literally do that. However, before the fall, before they took of the fruit that God had forbidden them to eat, they experienced a walk with God in perfect harmony. Complete access, seemingly, with the creator of the world. And implied in this walk that they had with God is a closeness, an intimacy, a communion that they would have had with him. What spurred, what caused, what instigated that relationship? What was it that led to that? God loved Adam and Eve. Y'all remember Sunday morning? The awesome love of God. And God wanted to have fellowship with his created beings. Ask yourself this question. Which came first, man's need for a relationship with God or God's desire to have a relationship with man? Which came first? And while you're considering that, that, I think we have a biblical answer. Found in the New Testament, we know, according to the book of 1 John, chapter 4, verse number 19, we love him because he first loved us. In Genesis chapter 5, at verse number 1, the Bible talks about the book of the genealogy of Adam in the day that God created man. He made him in the likeness of God. Why did God create man like he made man? Now, I don't pretend to know everything about it, but I think there are some things that should stand out for us as we study through the Word of God. God gave man a mind so that we can know God. God gave man a heart, that is emotions, so that men could love him back. God gave man a will, that is, gave him the ability to have freedom of choice so that he could choose to obey God. God gave man a soul so that we can eternally live with him. Those are some good reasons why God made man the way that he did. Have you ever paid close attention to what is said in the book of John, chapter 17, at verse number 24? It's in this real Lord's prayer, the one that he was praying again on the night before his crucifixion, that he prayed these words. He said, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me, talking specifically first about the apostles, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am that they may behold the glory my glory which you have given me for you love me before the foundation of the world folks you take your friends to your house and you show them your stuff don't you you show them that new rifle. You show them that new car. You show them that new room that you've just redecorated. You show those things, not necessarily to brag because, you know, you're just showing those things. You're proud of those things, but you're proud of them with your friend. And those are the ones that you carried with you to see those. Jesus wants you to come home with him, to see him as he truly is. In Psalm 27, at verse number 4, the psalmist wrote and said, One thing I have declared, desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. Now, now, now watch here where he say, or when he says he wants to dwell in the house of the Lord. All the days of my life. 
to behold the beauty of the Lord and in, to inquire in His temple. It seems that the psalmist is talking about his life here on the earth in this place. He said, I want to I be in God's presence here. But if you go to that familiar psalm, Psalm 23, here's what you're going to find in verse number 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And you can finish it, can't you? And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The psalmist wanted to be close to God. Philippians chapter 1, verse number 23 Paul would write and say, For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. You know what Paul said? If I just translate that in in, uh, Walker County language, you know what he said? He said something like this I'm ready to go to heaven. Paul, why are you ready to go to heaven? It's interesting what he didn't say. Paul didn't say, I'm ready to go to heaven so I can get rid of this pesky thorn in the flesh. Oh, he wanted it removed. He'd asked God three times to remove it. God said, my grace is sufficient for you. How many times have we said, I'm ready to go on because I'm tired of hurting? That would be a motivating factor for a Christian. And I'm not sure there's anything wrong with that. There was a lady who lived in, an uh, elderly lady who lived in Atwood, Tennessee when I was there. And she was already elderly when I moved there. And there wasn't a single time, I don't believe, when I went to visit her, and I visited her often, that she didn't say something like this, I wish I could just go on. She was ready. She was a faithful Christian. I wish I could just go on. Well, why, Miss Martha? All the people that I've known here, all my friends, all those dear sisters in Christ, they've already gone. I'm tired of struggling with some of the things that I've had to struggle with. She came in from church. Her husband was not a member of the church, not a Christian. She came into church, one, in from church one Sunday morning, and he was in his recliner. And he had gone on back to God. And he wasn't a Christian. And it wasn't that she was making an excuse to say, I want to go see him, because we talked often about, oh, how sad she was, because he died in a lost state. She made the statement, oh, I wish, I just wish I could go on. Paul said, I'm ready to go to heaven. But he didn't say, because I want to get rid of this pesky thorn in the flesh. Paul didn't say, I'm ready to go to heaven because if I do that, I'll never have to take another beating. I'll never have to have be in another shipwreck. He didn't say that, did he? What did he say? I want to go to heaven because I want to be with Christ. That's far better, he said. I want to be with him. He would write in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, So we're always confident, knowing that while we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight, We're confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. We could continue to mount evidence from the scriptures tonight that seems to indicate one of the greatest things that one could ever imagine about heaven is because that's where our Father is. That's where our elder brother is. To be able to be with them, with the Holy Spirit, in eternity is one of the greatest things that we have to look forward to. As we begin to bring this lesson to a close tonight, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 34 says, 
For you had compassion on me in my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. The abiding, we could say enduring, reward of God to be with him forever. James wrote and said, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he, has, uh, when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. James chapter 1 at verse number 12. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 at verse number 12, Paul wrote and said, If we endure, we shall reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Take this home with you tonight. Heaven is an enduring or abiding place of reward for an enduring and abiding people. Those who endure this life living as a Christian, abide in Christ, walking in the light, whatever metaphor we could use from the scriptures, that's who heaven is for. Maybe you began that journey in the past. You believe that Jesus was the Christ. Without faith it is impossible to please him. For the one who comes to God must believe that he is. And he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Hebrews chapter 11 at verse 6. Maybe you believe that Jesus is the Christ. If you don't believe, then we have no hope. Maybe you're at one point, repented of the sins that you had in your life. We've already mentioned this passage before in the book of Luke chapter 13, verse 3, also in verse 5, I tell you no, but except you repent, you will all likewise perish. In that passage, he's talking about some who perished physically. In the teaching, Jesus is talking about perishing spiritually. Repentance. There's confession the great confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. With a heart man believes, with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. And sprinkled throughout our lessons this week, we've talked a little bit about baptism. Unless we're washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, we'll never have contact with that cleansing blood, and the only way we can be washed in it is to be buried in his death. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Maybe you started that journey a long time ago. May I beg you? Do not be stopping halfway. If somewhere along the way you've stopped off to sit on the porch and to look at life and you've never completed the trip, may I beg you to get off the porch and finish the journey. Be a finisher. Not just a motto, but your way of life. So that one day, we can be welcomed home. Not just to have freedom from a lot of things that we consider to be bad. Freedom from being in the bad place, hell. Freedom from pain and suffering and death and all of those things. Not just because we want freedom from those things, but because I want to spend eternity with a God who loves me, has invited me, has made it possible for me to be a part of his church where he has placed his saved people so that one day, whether it's through our death, whether it's by his return, we can be prepared to enter in hearing those words, well done. I want to have that abiding place, that abiding reward of God. Don't you? 
If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation that you might have that this very night, why don't you come right now as we stand and as we sing?